This week, the Pope calls an extraordinary synod. And it's the anniversary of the Second Vatican Council. Hello and welcome to Vatican Connections for the week of October 11th. An extraordinary synod of bishops will be held October 5th to 19th next year. Now, we were still trying to find out exactly what had been discussed at the Council of Cardinals meeting almost a week ago, and we didn't notice that the Pope was meeting with the General Secretariat of the Synod of Bishops. On Monday, a Vatican official posted a photo on his personal Facebook page of a Vatican City vehicle pulling up to the office of the Synod of Bishops on Via della Conciliazione. That put us all on alert. One astute reporter with inside contacts tweeted, changes are coming soon. Sure enough, the next morning there was an announcement from the Vatican. The Holy Father has called for the third extraordinary Synod of Bishops to be held in the Vatican. The theme is the pastoral challenges of the family in the context of evangelization. A slightly longer statement from the Holy See Press Office stating that the Holy Father wants to study the pastoral challenges surrounding the family and the way he wants to do that is through a, a synod which involves representatives from the church around the world. The statement also said having individuals or pastoral offices implement new strategies on their own creates confusion around the church. Now, this isn't really a big surprise to Vatican watchers. On his return flight from Rio, the Pope told journalists he wanted to review how the Synod of Bishop works and that he wanted to see topics that were more practical and he thought the family was an area that needed to be discussed. One example, the Archdiocese of Freiburg, Germany announced this week that they have new guidelines for divorced and civilly remarried Catholics who wish to receive communion, except there's been no change in church teaching. Some have tried to say this synod is a reaction to what's been happening in Germany, but really what happened in Germany is proof of what the Holy Father has been saying. We need to pay more attention to the real needs and challenges facing families of today and tackle some of the tough pastoral questions. Another much anticipated announcement came this week, but this one from the Legionaries of Christ and Renum Christi. The Legionaries will be holding a general chapter starting January 8, 2014, and the consecrated women of Renum Christi will have a general assembly this year from December 2nd to 15th. The purpose of both is to finish the revision of the general constitution of these two groups. Both the Legionaries and Renum Christi were founded by Marcial Maciel, who we now know led a double life, fathering children and abusing young men in his seminaries. Pope Benedict XVI appointed a visitator who studied the organization and leadership of the Legionaries and eventually of Renum Christi, which is a parallel movement. The announcement of the General Chapter and the General Assembly were made via a statement posted on the Order's website. Last Thursday, the day before Pope Francis went to Assisi, we learned of a tragedy off the coast of Lampedusa, Italy. A ship carrying migrants from northern Africa sank, killing over 230 people. This week, we learned that Pope Francis sent his almoner, Archbishop Konrad Krajewski, to Lampedusa. He was there meeting with those who survived, looking at what help was needed, and he even went out with Coast Guard crews as they searched for bodies. Archbishop Krajewski was on the phone with the Pope every afternoon, updating him about the situation. Another item we're hearing about this week is a newly released book written by the Italian journalist Nello Scavo. It's called Bergoglio's List, Saved by Francis During the Dictatorship. Scavo is a journalist for L'Avenire, the Italian newspaper owned by the Italian Bishops' Conference. Now, he usually covers legal and judicial issues. He was intrigued, however, by the stories that surfaced after the conclave about Pope Francis and his involvement with Argentina's military regime during the Dirty War. Scavo started digging to find out how and why certain parties wanted to make people believe that Bergoglio cooperated with the regime. 
Instead, he uncovered multiple stories and corroborating testimony about how Bergoglio very quietly, but very simply, saved people from the military government. And the book is available right now only in Italian. Finally, a cultural first for the Vatican. The Vatican Publishing House is participating in the Frankfurt Book Fair for the first time. The five-day event is the event of the year for the publishing industry. Different publishers promote their upcoming titles and other organizations present new initiatives and technology that will impact the way we buy and read books. The Vatican Publishing House has a booth at the fair this year and is promoting a range of published and upcoming titles. Did you know? You can request a papal blessing for a number of occasions. You can get the formula of the blessing printed on a special parchment at the Office of Papal Charities. The parchment costs between 25 and 40 euros, and all the money goes towards funding the Pope's charitable works and donations. This week is the 51st anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. So on today's feature interview, Catholic News Service brings us this interview with Archbishop Loris Capovilla. As a young priest, Capovilla served as Pope John's personal secretary. He spoke to CNS about how the idea for the council came to be. I ho 97 anni. Va bene. E allora conosco Papa Giovanni dal 1935. Il 2 novembre 1958, cioè cinque giorni dopo la elezione, il cardinale Ernesto Ruffini, come tutti i cardinali, a turno è andato in udienza dal Papa. Eh, ha detto abbiamo parecchi problemi, situazioni difficili, sia di carattere religioso, storico, diplomatico. E nella carta, nella carta delle udienze, il Papa scrive la parola per la prima volta, concilio. Anche altri vescovi tutti portavano vari temi, molti erano per la riforma liturgica dei seminari, della disciplina del clero, problemi non dottrinali ma pastorali. Passano 20 giorni, mi dice, mi dice sul mio tavolo si accumulano problemi, domande, richieste, speranze, ci, vo ci vorrebbe proprio un consiglio. E io ho taciuto. Dice, mi sono chiesto perché il mio segretario gli faccio una confidenza una volta la seconda volta non dice nulla. No, ma io so perché tu hai fatto questo. Tu hai pensato, è vecchio. No, sì, sì. Ma poi sei, ti sei preoccupato. E tu gli hai fatto con buona intenzione. Cioè, è vecchio. Cioè, ma si mette un, un pasticcio di questo... pasticcio in, in questo compito così enorme. Cioè, non avrai il tempo. Perché tu se ragioni come un commendatore un delegato di banca. Non è mica così che si ragiona in, con la fede. Ricevere una buona ispirazione e guardarla con ammirazione e dire oh, quanto mi piacerebbe, è già un grande merito. Se poi Dio ti concedesse di trovare con l'aiuto dei collaboratori che ti incoraggia ad andare avanti, meglio ancora, e se tu cominciassi anche solo con la commissione antepreparatoria, è già un grande merito. Se tu muori e viene un altro, e dice, grande onore anche solo cominciare. Ma perché Papa Giovanni ha fatto il concilio? Papa Giovanni, parlando con il suo segretario di Stato, ha detto, guardi che dopo la seconda guerra mondiale è molto bello che siano sorti tre istituti internazionali e sono nati in America. L'ONU per la pace, la FAO per il pane, l'UNESCO per la cultura. Io, io sono il Papa, non ricevo sempre, si fanno congressi di filosofia, di letteratura, di commercio. Perché non ci troviamo anche noi insieme a parlare?
avrebbe ripetuto questo, come ha detto all'inizio del concilio, no? l'ha detto, entriamo in concilio con il patrimonio della tradizione da, da Nicea sino al concilio di Trento e il Vaticano I. L'ha detto chiaro questo, cosa doveva dire di più? Proprio perché era un grande conservatore ha potuto portare al mondo un messaggio di amore, di speranza e di fiducia. This week brought a small handful of appointments. The Dominican Republic has a new papal nuncio. Archbishop Jude Thaddeus Ocolo will move from the Central African Republic to the Dominican Republic to represent the Pope. The appointment comes after the previous nuncio to this Caribbean nation was removed from the position in light of serious allegations of sexual abuse that are still being investigated. And in Brazil, Bishop Merrick Marian Piatek becomes Bishop of Coari, Amazonas. One more diplomatic move, Canada's nuncio has returned to Rome after five years as a nuncio here. No word yet on who the new papal representative will be. After last week's trip to Assisi, Pope Francis slowed down just a little bit, but he still managed to keep everyone on their toes. On Monday, the Holy Father met with the King and Queen of Lethoso. During the meeting, the Pope spoke about the importance the King has put on religious freedom as well as education and health care. The King praised the contribution of the Church in the area of justice and peace, and the conversation focused on social justice issues. On Tuesday, Pope Francis attended the meeting of the General Secretariat of the Synod of Bishops. This was not on his published schedule. Whatever happened in that meeting, we know that the next day the Vatican announced the Pope's call for an extraordinary synod. Wednesday was the Pope's general audience as usual, and here's more from CNS. La Chiesa è cattolica perché la casa dell'armonia, dove unità e diversità sanno congiugarsi insieme per essere ricchezza. Pensiamo all'immagine della sinfonia, che vuol dire accordo, armonia. Diversi strumenti suonano insieme. Ognuno mantiene il suo timbro inconfondibile e le caratteristiche di suono si accordano su qualcosa di comune. Poi c'è chi guida, il direttore, e nella sinfonia che viene eseguita tutti suonano insieme in armonia. Ma non viene cancellato il timbro di ogni strumento. La peculiarità di ciascuno, anzi, è valorizzato al massimo. È una bella immagine de che ci dice che la Chiesa è come una grande orchestra in cui c'è varietà. Non siamo tutti uguali e non dobbiamo essere tutti, tutti uguali. Tutti siamo diversi, differenti, ognuno con le proprie qualità. E questo è il bello della Chiesa. Ognuno importa il suo, quello che Dio le ha dato per arricchire alle altre. L'uniformità uccide la vita. La vita della Chiesa è varietà e quando vogliamo mettere questa uniformità a tutti uccidiamo i doni dello Spirito Santo. Preghiamo lo Spirito Santo che è proprio l'autore di questa unità nella varietà di questa armonia perché ci renda sempre più cattolici. On Thursday, Pope Francis had a special audience with members of the Supreme Council of the Knights of Columbus. Pope Francis thanked them for their support of his and the Holy See's activities through the Vicarious Christi Fund. He said he entrusts them and their work to St. Joseph. That same day, he also met with the president of Croatia, Ivo Josipovic. The Holy See said Croatia's joining the European Union was the topic of discussion. On Friday, Pope Francis was scheduled to meet with the President of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz. And Saturday and Sunday, the Pope was scheduled to preside over a Marian prayer service at St. Peter's, 
followed by a Mass on Sunday to mark this Marian Day. Oh, and one more. Pope Francis also met with the leadership of the U.S. Bishops Conference, and there was some entertaining footage of that meeting, during which Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York made himself quite at home in the Papal Library, much to the pontiff's amusement. E dopo se, dopo se, ah, congratulazione. Ah, Santo Padre, potremo parlare in inglese? Sì, perché il mio inglese è un voto. And we need you, ok? Ci vediamo questo pomeriggio, eh? Ok? Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for me, please. Grazie, Santo Padre. Grazie mille. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you. I will pray for you. With the announcement of an extraordinary synod to be held next October, we received many questions about synods. Shannon O'Collins tweeted a question. She asked, what is an extraordinary synod? To answer your question, Shannon, an extraordinary synod means that the topic being discussed is more urgent, the preparation time for the synod will be shorter, and the participants may be fewer. It can take two years or more to prepare for an ordinary synod. There have only been two other extraordinary synods in 1969 and 1985. In 1969, the synod was about the cooperation between the Holy See and the Episcopal Conferences. The 1985 Synod was about the 20th anniversary of the close of the Second Vatican Council. Our second question this week comes from Kate Moon via Facebook. She asks, what are the hours of the Apostolic Palace for ticket pickup? Well, you can get tickets for any general audience or papal mass at the bronze doors of the Apostolic Palace. Now, if you're looking at the basilica, go to the colonnade on your right. And walking through that colonnade, right after you come to the metal detectors, you'll see a staircase and a set of big bronze doors guarded by Swiss guards. That's where you pick up your tickets. Pick them up the day before the general audience or papal mass you want to attend, between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. in the afternoon. If you can't manage that and you want to pick up tickets for an audience on the day of, get to the bronze doors between 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Now remember, for the canonization of Pope John Paul II and John XXIII, tickets will not be required. Keep your questions coming, here's how. Vatican Connections is interactive. Send us your questions or comments by Facebook, Twitter, email, or post. Via email, send comments to info at saltandlighttv.org. And by post, send letters to 114 Richmond Street East, Toronto, Ontario, M5C1P1, Canada. On today's Roman profile, we take a look at Angelo Roncalli, better known as Pope John XXIII. Our own Father Thomas Rosica offers this look at the man who changed the face of the Church. The date of October the 11th is the anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council in 1962. An interesting point not known to many people is that Pope John Paul II assigned October the 11th as the feast day of blessed Pope John the 23rd, and not his day of death, which was June 3rd, 1963. Pope John the 23rd and the Council are therefore forever linked together. As time moves forward, today's younger generations really don't know this good and great Pope. Angelo Roncalli, the third of 13 children, was born to a family of sharecroppers on November 25, 1881, at Sotto il Monte in northern Italy. At the age of 12, he entered the diocesan seminary at Bergamo and came under the influence of progressive leaders of the Italian social movement. He was ordained priest on August 10, 1904, and soon appointed the secretary to the new Bishop of Bergamo, learning from him forms of social action and gaining an understanding of the problems of the working classes. 
He also taught at the diocesan seminary. In 1915, he was called to the army in World War I and served on the front lines in the Medical and Chaplaincy Corps. In 1921, he was called to Rome by the Pope and made director of the Society for the Propagation of the Faith in Italy. He was consecrated Archbishop in 1925 and sent to Bulgaria. In 1934, he was sent to Turkey and Greece in the Diplomatic Corps of the Church. When he was 64 years old in 1944, an age when most people are thinking of retirement, Roncalli was chosen by Pius XII for the difficult post of Nuncio to Paris, where he worked to heal the divisions called by the Second World War. At age 72, he was made Cardinal and Patriarch of Venice, and he had charge of a large diocese for the first time in his life. He quickly won the affection of his people, visiting parishes, caring for the working classes, establishing new parishes, and developing forms of social action. In 1958, at nearly 77 years of age, he was elected Pope upon the death of Pius XII. He was expected by many to be a caretaker and transitional pope, but he astonished the church and the world with his energy and reforming spirit. He expanded and internationalized the College of Cardinals, called the first diocesan synod of Rome in history, revised the Code of Canon Law, and called the Second Vatican Council with the specific purpose of renewing the life of the church and its teachings and reuniting Christians throughout the world. In his opening address on October the 11th, 1962, at the beginning of the Vatican Council, Pope John said these words, In the everyday exercise of our pastoral ministry, greatly to our sorrow, we sometimes have to listen to those who, although consumed with zeal, do not have much judgment or balance. To them, the modern world is nothing but betrayal and ruination. They claim that this age is far worse than previous ages, and they go on as though they had learned nothing from history, and yet history is the great teacher of life. They behave as though the first five centuries saw a complete vindication of the Christian idea and the Christian cause, and as though religious liberty was never put in jeopardy in the past. We feel bound to disagree with these prophets of misfortune who are forever forecasting calamity, as though the end of the world is imminent. Our task is not merely to hoard this precious treasure of doctrine, as though obsessed with the past, but to give ourselves eagerly and without fear to the task that this present age demands of us, and in doing so, we will be faithful to what the Church has done in the past 20 centuries. Then on the night of October the 11th, 1962, the opening of the Council, Papa Giovanni appeared at his window in answer to the chanting and singing below from a crowd estimated at perhaps a half a million people assembled in St. Peter's Square. And many were young people who came in procession with candles and singing. It was a spontaneous World Youth Day long before they began formally. His impromptu window speech that night is now part of Rome's legends. It's known as the Discorso della Luna. In a high-pitched voice, he said, Carissimi giovani, carissimi giovani, dearest children, I hear your voice. In the simplest language, he told them about his hopes for the council. He pointed out the moon that was shining brightly upon the crowd the moon that was observing this spectacle in the square. And then he said, my voice is an isolated one, but it echoes the voice of the whole world. Here, in effect, the whole world is represented in you. He then concluded, tornando a casa, as you return to your homes, give your little children a kiss. Tell them it's from the Pope. The emotion that night was palpable. The patriarch, the father, who was bearing the burden of age and illness, gave and generated love with all of his being. On that first night of the Second Vatican Council, a new era began for the Church, an era that continues to bear fruit in today's Church. The years of work and compromise, countless words and conversations, endless wrangling over documents, would both produce and accompany a sea of change in the Church. However, for all of the lofty words, 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 and texts and documents that went into the Council, 
the historic gathering on October the 11th, 1962, that opening night of Vatican II, was infused with the deep and stirring humanity of its author. On his deathbed in early June 1963, Papa Giovanni said, It's not that the gospel has changed. It is that we have begun to understand it better. Those who have lived as long as I have were enabled to compare different cultures and traditions and know that the moment has come to discern the signs of the times, to seize the opportunity, and to look far ahead. Pope John thought that the Council would conclude within a few months, but instead he died before its second session. When he died on June 3, 1963, he won the widespread affection of Christians and non-Christians alike. Papa Giovanni, as he was called, the Good Pope, endeared himself to millions of people throughout the world. You see, Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli was a human being more concerned with his faithfulness than his image, more concerned with those around him than with his own desires. With an infectious warmth and vision, he stressed the relevance of the Church in a rapidly changing society and made the Church's deepest truths stand out in a modern world. The great philosopher Santayana wrote, Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. As we remember John the 23rd on his feast day on October the 11th each year and behold his bold, daring vision for the Church and for humanity, let us beg his intercession that God's word be known and loved in the Church and in the world. For all of the lofty words, documents, and texts that flow from the Church, let us pray that they be first infused with the deep and stirring humanity of John the 23rd, who revived the Church from her historical and ecclesial slumber at a moment when no one really expected it. Blessed John the 23rd, pray for us. Help us to keep the authentic message of the Second Vatican Council alive in the Church today. That's it for this week's edition of Vatican Connections. Remember, you can keep up with what's happening at the Vatican on a daily basis if you're on Twitter by following us at Vaticanections. Thanks for watching and join us next week as we take a look at the role of women in the Church.